Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Carolyn, for the invitation and for uh, all the rest of you for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Nick says, I'm a media historian. Uh, I just finished a book that I'm calling A Media History of Documents. Um, it is about the genre of the document, um, but because I'm a media historian, I work it across uh, different medial technologies from 19th century commercial printing to the PDF file. I'm happy to talk about that project. Um, this talk today is um, uh, from the end of it. Um, and it's a bit ortho orthogonal to the, um, you'll see, to the genre of the document. Um, uh, but basically, I was going around the country giving talks about things like Xeroxes and mimeographs. And everywhere I went, somebody would ask, are you going to talk about zines? It was bugging me to death. Um, uh, you know, I realized the pressing relevance of amateur cultural production, right? Um, uh, convergence culture, YouTube ascendant, um, the pajama army of the blogosphere. Um, but this question that kept coming up about zines, you know, are you going to talk about zines, wasn't really about the internet, at least not explicitly. Um, uh, you know, so I detected nostalgia. Um, I detected worse. I detected, you know, kind of pie-eyed cultural studies trapped in a kind of celebration of subcultural uh, expression as c cultural critique. Um, uh, and I detected really sloppy media history, right? Rushing to connect while failing to distinguish. Um, Clay Shirky, for instance, has suggested that the mass amateurization of um, publishing on the internet could be likened to the mass amateurization of literacy after the invention of movable type. I mean, it's a fantastic analogy, right, in a seven-league boots kind of way. I love it. Um, but certainly worthy of scrutiny and so, uh, by some of us in sensible shoes. Um, so <laughs> I guess I did eventually start to wonder, you know, uh, what about zines? How would amateur cultural production have a history. Um, and the kind of outgrowth of this is the what is a zine question that I'm going to try and work my way slowly toward uh, in this talk. Um, so I confess I've started to really wonder what should a history of amateurization look like? Uh, and in particular, how would an account of amateurs and amateur cultural production um, be helpful in rendering uh, the scope and structure of what I'll call the scriptural economy? Um, so scriptural economy is a term cooked up by Michel de Certeau decades ago um, to refer to um, the kind of endless tapestry of writings and writings um, that function as both discipline and myth. Um, discipline because we know that um, uh, writing works as a kind of profound uh, regime of socialization and control or tool of uh, socialization and control. And myth because we know that writings uh, accumulate with and certainly kind of as the uh, weight of history itself. Um, so this scriptural economy um, uh, is sort of my grounding contention is that it began to expand precipitously um, in the 19th century. Um, it's a totality um, uh, of writing and writings that has generally eluded um, uh, scholarly attention because of the ways that contemporary disciplines um, divide uh, and construct their subjects. Um, not only did advancing literacies and the proliferation of print formats uh, um, uh, and the widespread adoption of new media um, help to complicate 19th century experiences of writing and of writtenness, um, of graphy and graphies or graphism, if you like, um, but the specialized labors of printing and the look of printedness were themselves reframed by the eventual new devices um, for the production and the reproduction of writing. Um, so I want to go back in time and start with my favorite printer of the moment. His name is Oscar Harple of Cincinnati. Um, because of two titles that he self-published, one in 1870 and one in 1875, um, the first has been lovingly digitized by the Internet Archive. Um, it's called The Typograph. The subtitle is what interests me, containing useful information, suggestions, and a collection uh, of examples of letterpress job printing arranged for the assistance of master printers, amateurs, apprentices, and others. Um, the second title, from five years later, is called Poets and Poetry of Printerdom. This one has been less lovingly digitized um, by Google. Um, there it is. Um, and again, the subtitle explains that it's a collection of poetry um, by people associated with uh, uh, printing. Um, now, what interests me is that taken together, these two titles testify to an incredibly imp important moment that has been largely overlooked by media history. Um, and that's the moment when um, printers were about to lose or losing their monopoly on print. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, but before the Civil War, um, you could say that authors only penned while only printers printed. There was a huge divide 
between those able to produce what looked like print and those who were not able to. Um, and it was a relatively select bunch, um, the printers, the printing trades, um, uh, who could print. Um, so uh, um, and both these titles sort of work together, um, but I think if you think about what the, the title of Poets and Poetry or Printerdom implies, it's that in a sense, see, printers can be authors too. So I think we have to listen very carefully for a kind of a plaintive undertone um, that if printers can be authors, really authors should not be printers. Um, and yet you see already from five years before, the subtitle of the typograph addresses itself partly um, to amateurs. Um, it seems likely that Harple's use of the term printerdom in 1875 then was a reaction to another coinage, um, amateurdom. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary here is no help whatsoever um, since its compilers find the um, suffix uh, dumb um, uh, in the sense of domain um, in general usage at 1880. Now it's really easy to antedate the OED now that we have searchable databases. Um, so I can't nail this down exactly. Um, the compiler is called DOM a nonce derivative, right? Something that you kind of pick up and use once or twice on the fly. Um, and just again from poking around in the databases, it seems clear to me that printer DOM was in fact a nonce derivative, as incidentally is the term nonce derivative. It's actually a nonce form. Um, but uh, Amateurdom was not, it had legs, um, because we know that by um, the early 1870s, a growing number of um, uh, uh, individuals, um, writers, editors, and printers, participated in a domain that some of them sometimes called simply the dumb. Um, so the character of amateurdom um, can be gleaned um, from the collections of the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Mass, which has a collection of 50,000 amateur newspapers, and there's a collection about four times that size being processed at the University of Wisconsin. Um, the earliest examples, so from before this, before 1870 or so, um, are either pen printed, in other words, written by hand to look like print, um, or job printed, that is by hiring uh, printers. Um, but the collection indicates a tenfold increase in production after 1869 um, when a small press called the Novelty Press came on the market uh, aimed at amateurs, first at like merchants and druggists who could print their own price cards and things, um, and then at uh, boys. Um, so here's an ad for the Novelty Press, um, more promotional material. You see the domestic setting. I love the little guy over there. Um, so a, a cursory survey of the DUM uh, can be gleaned from contemporary sources, and I'm just going to use two in a rough and ready kind of way. An article from the children's magazine St. Nicholas from 1882, um, and a year later, the publication of this 330-page reminiscence um, by one Thomas Henry Harrison. Um, and he spends um, the bulk of this 330 pages, by the way, sort of recounts his career as an amateur journalist um, all the way from, uh, eight, from 1875 all the way to 1878. Right, so from the age of 15 to the age of 18. Um, and there was a second volume promised. <laughs> um, now, accounts like these uh, actually agree in most of their particulars because it, it seems that the features of amateurdom see, uh, quickly came to have a, a potted quality, rehearsed again and again as core themes that consumed the geographically vast literary society of this little literary world, as Harrison put it. Um, amateurdom was intensely self-referential, um, forever consolidating itself as itself. And people who look at these little papers today are amazed at their lack of content. Um, they're really about amateurdom as a phenomenon commenting on each other's um, papers and the papers they receive. Um, motivations were clear. Um, uh, the point was to become known to, and indeed even to become storied among, um, the large and widely dispersed group of uh, amateurs um, with whom you traded your publications via the mails. Um, so there are lots of really interesting things about amateurdom um, organized as such, um, but I'm going to try and uh, focus on just one today, so don't get too uh, out of control, um, and that is what exactly the amateur in amateurdom specifies. Um, uh, uh, Harrison indicates when um, a publication he refers to is prof uh, by comparison, um, but I guess the first thing I'd say is I think it'd be a mistake to distinguish amateur from professional and leave it at that, because that dichotomy right, needs to be historicized, 
it needs to be forever historicized and kind of introduces anachronism um, if you wield it too bluntly. Um, among other things, professional journalism as such did not exist, right? No journalism schools, uh, no uh, associations for professional journalists, um, no avowed ideal uh, uh, of objectivity um, yet in evidence. Um, and we know things that auth like authorship, um, publishing, editing, were themselves professional in this period uh, of the uh, postbellum era, only in the sense that people made or were known to make um, a living um, through some combination um, of these roles. Um, printing um, itself was, uh, of course, not a profession. Um, it was a trade. Um, it was a trade dressing itself as an art, um, famously the art preservative uh, of other arts. Um, one that had for decades been experiencing wrenching structural changes, um, loosely industrialization, right, as some work um, became de-skilled and mechanized, like press work, and other work, like typesetting, was not or not yet. Um, the apprenticeship and journeyman system was breaking down. Um, print uh, production is experiencing explosive growth in this period, um, but talented journeyman printers like Oscar Harple um, really suffered. So uh, a, a very fluid picture um, there. Um, in particular, the, this jobbing press, or the commercial press, um, became more and more distinct from newspaper work or book publishing in this period. Um, and one of those points of distinguishing or, or, or of distinction um, was technological. Um, more and more versions of the jobbing press, these smaller platen presses, which eventually then become miniaturized um, for children. Um, uh, every man his own printer was one tagline, every boy a Ben Franklin. Um, uh, and I actually have a, just a little bit of a sidebar here. This is um, William St. Clair's uh, picture of editions of Don Juan across um, the 19th century. Um, he's making a point about cost, in particular about intellectual property and cost, um, and the way the book market sort of tranches down to different classes um, over time. Um, and I just, the picture just sort of reminded me of this picture of the little platen presses within the same period. Um, but be careful, it's really an analogy, not a correlation. Um, <laughs> the amateur papers, though, um, and I should have brought pictures of them, are by and large, they're, they vary in size, but lots of them are tiny. Um, three by six inches, because they're printed on these little tiny presses. Um, according to Harrison, the real history of amateurdom didn't begin until the novelty press, um, and other accounts agree. Um, so the figure cut by Benjamin O. Woods and his little platen or lever press in these accounts, um, like those that have followed, um, might suggest that amateurdom might be um, sort of thought of in technological terms. Um, but I think that this, too, um, would be a mistake. Um, uh, um, uh, let's generalize, uh, if we can, um, that new media do not themselves make amateur cultural producers. Um, access to new tools was key, um, but uh, more importantly, I think um, we have to, following Karen Sanchez Epler, think about access to commercial culture, to consumer culture. Um, Sanchez Epler has worked on the enormous and extremely swift shifts in the cultural understanding of childhood work and play then underway in American culture. Um, childhood leisure, and here especially boyhood leisure because of domestic labor, um, was a class privilege, increasingly enshrined in compulsory schooling laws and epitomized in the merchandising of goods specifically for children. Um, by this lights, the amateurs of amateurdom, uh, mostly but not entirely male, um, can't be defined against prof as much as they can against the figure of a working class child. Um, so Thomas Harrison's corresponding other wasn't Oscar Harple. Um, it was the newsboy, um, the boot black, uh, the uh, printer's um, uh, trade apprentice, or a throwback, the, the printer's devil. Um, if the figure of the working class child was associated in the popular imagination with play, as Sanchez Epler indicates, then it made perfect sense that, the, that middle class play got associated with work. Um, again and again, the amateurs uh, insist to their readers how hard they work, how much time and money and effort their papers require, um, while stressing that their efforts were self-improving, yet money losing, um, not profit making. Um, so in uh, so adamantly describing itself as a realm of hard work and money losing, amateurs were able at once to participate in con consumer culture um, while rejecting its logic. Um, they weren't just buying the same things. Um, they uh, spent time and energy um, but lost money. 
Um, the repeated lip service paid to nonprofit production locates amateur newspapers, um, as Miranda Joseph writes about nonprofit organizations generally, um, at the absent heart of capitalism, a place where the very subjects of capitalism have gone missing, revealing their discontents. Um, and these uh, um, subjects abscond um, by dint of um, uh, uh, compensatorially um, communitarian endeavors. Um, today, we'd call the result community, same root as communism. Um, by at least 1872 or 73, they said amateurdom. Um, now, the amateurs were individually um, ambitious, uh, unstintingly critical of one another. It's an incredibly fractious bunch, um, dressing their labors in a, in a kind of classically liberal discourse of the educable self. I mean, these really were capitalists in training. Um, at the same time, um, they were playing this sort of countervailing um, uh, communal um, uh, 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 sort of uh, sphere. Um, now, these tensions um, involved uh, with training for capital capitalism by abandoning its putative object, profit, um, made perfect sense within the ongoing construction of young adulthood as a liminal sphere, right? Uh, 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 between and yet neither. We might consider, too, that these same tensions emerged partly uh, as an outgrowth of readerly subjectivities evolved in the postbellum explosion of secular magazines for young readers. Um, uh, Harrison himself um, acknowledges amateurdom's debt um, to Oliver Optics magazine, um, which editorialized as chirpily, uh, as early as, uh, uh, chirpily and as early as July 1870s, uh, 1867, um, it's, so it's first year, that we suppose Lowe's press is best for boys. If they don't like it, try Hose. Um, and I'm really a hardware geek, so I, I'm showing the presses instead of what they're printing, and, which I realize is bad. But um, so this is a Lowe's press. Um, it was a field press, kind of a proofing press um, used uh, uh, during the Civil War. Um, and just so you get the joke, that's the hose press there. Um, so Oliver Optics magazine is one of this huge, you know, sort of uh, burst of magazines that come on the scene in the postbellum moment that are secular and addressed to children. They all have letters columns. Oliver Optics very quickly has another column in, a, in addition to these correspondence columns um, called Wish Correspondence um, that lets uh, readers write in, specify what they want to correspond with other readers about, and thereby sort of cut the magazine out of the circuit, right? So connecting um, readers that way through the mails. Um, like the shared fantasy of a textual commons, which Jared Gardner suspects cuts across, uh, cut across the success of so many of the earliest American magazines um, by encouraging feelings of shared ownership that may have actually um, uh, inhibited the paying up of subscriptions. These new magazines for children carried mixed messages. Um, yes, they were crucial agents in the interpolation of children as uh, the subjects of consumer culture, um, and yet they also helped um, uh, spin this accessory magic uh, of a less or even a non-commercial um, communal domain. Um, so the, the, um, the fin de siècle psychologists who would eventually describe adolescence as a stage in life um, uh, noticed um, a reading craze as kind of symptomatic of some uh, adolescence. I mean, I think if they had stumbled upon amateurdom, they would have just described it as an extremely acute um, version of the reading craze, right? Readers who were so, um, uh, so crazed um, that they, they wrote, edited, um, uh, printed, and published. Um, one example is chronicled in amateur lore. Um, following the model of earlier magazines, Golden Days for Boys and Girls um, cultivated correspondence clubs among its readers. Um, uh, and then um, uh, at some point, one of the members of one of these clubs suggested, hey, let's have a little newspaper. Um, the idea caught fire, so then you get multiple um, clubs of readers with their individual papers uh, until one day, um, it was September 2nd, 1895, um, a 14-year-old named William H. Greenfield um, started the United Amateur Press Association um, to organize them all. Um, and that same trajectory um, from the readership of commercially published magazines with letters columns to clubs of readers um, to amateur publications and finally to a self-organizing sphere of postal uh, communication and exchange um, also would describe the kind of 1930s birth of uh, fanzine, fandom, um, as it was called, science fiction fandom. Um, but that's just getting a little ahead of the story. I should, I should, I should caution that it's a pattern um, except when it's not. Um, 
So I can emphasize that, that uh, money losing amateurs like Harrison and Greenfield didn't say they were jumping off the good ship Capital, right, or, or deferring adulthood. Um, they said exactly the opposite. Um, it was really feelings uh, that gave them away. Amateurdom was an affective state as well as a textual comments. Um, young Harrison became possessed, he says, with a desire to jo join amateurdom. A printing fever seized amateur David Bethune. Elsewhere, it was a mania for editorship that prevailed. Um, the writer H.P. Lovecraft suffered a short-lived poetical delusion when he first encountered amateurdom in 1914 at the ripe age of 23. Um, as, Lev as Lovecraft explains in a great little reminiscence called What Amateurdom and I Have Done for Each Other, um, he was introduced to the United Amateur Press Association when he was as close to the state of vegetation as any animal uh, well can be. Perhaps I might have been uh, compared to the lowly potato in its secluded and subterranean quiescence. Um, so the United in which um, Lovecraft quickly becomes a kind of operatic um, uh, um, gave him at once a, um, a renewed will to live, the very world in which to live, uh, and also life itself. Um, so that figure of the lonely and secluded quiescent potato, known to us today, of course, as the couch potato, <laughs> Um, alludes, I think, to Samuel Butler's Arahone, um, which has this funny riff on the emotions and sentience of a potato. And of course, Lovecraft would go on to succeed as a professional writer in the Arahonian vein, um, at the same time that he remained a, a lifelong proponent and participant um, in amateurdom. Um, but I want to pause. Um, is amateurdom, uh, uh, the amateurdom that Lovecraft joined and described in the 1910s and 20s, the same amateurdom of Harrison and the rest from the 1870s and 80s? Um, better questions. Are amateurs of one era the amateurs of another? Is DIY publishing um, the same thing whenever and however you happen to D it? Um, so much of what Lovecraft says about the United rings uh, true. Um, uh, he acknowledges origins around 1870, notes common yearnings to have the thoughts and ideals permanently crystallized in the magic medium of type. Um, and he celebrates those who labor purely for love without the stultifying influence of commercialism. Um, the amateur press associations, the United and the National, formed back in um, uh, 1876, um, had persisted and matured, each holding annual meetings, publishing an official organ, um, serving as clearing houses, uh, uh, warding annual laureates, they called them, and the various genres of amateurdom, uh, poetry, sketch, history, and essay, um, as well as eventually a prize for the best home printed paper, which I think indicates a, a kind of decline in the number of people who were printing their own. Um, yet by Lovecraft's telling, amateurdom was open to all comers. Boys and girls of 12 and men and women of 60, parents and their sons and daughters, college professors and grammar school pupils. Um, so amateurdom, I think, had become less of a stage in life, a mixture of training for and unspoke, unspoken deferral of, um, and more of a kind of clubhouse or a hideaway, um, geared towards self-improving self-expression, um, tenanted by successive waves, um, actually probably trickles, um, of amateurs um, uh, warmed partly by the accumulated lore of years gone by. Um, uh, this lore is sort of peppered with the names of individual amateurs and the names of their generally short-lived papers. Along the way, we might speculate that amateurdom had also become less of a formative assertion of middle-class identity and more of a formative assertion within it. That same distinction between amateur and professional or commercial publications held sway, but no longer were the contrastive others of amateurdom, um, working class urban youths or the long gone trade apprentice. Um, more likely, the contrastive others of amateurdom um, were now either sorry couch potatoes, right, the isolate and quiescent subjects of the emergent mass culture, um, or they were other amateurs finding their own alternatives, some of which obviously would have been comfortable with the term, the label amateur, and others not. Um, so think of am organized amateur athletics, right, or um, high school yearbook and college newspaper. Um, uh, I wonder in particular about amateur radio, um, which exploded on the scene with the 1906 crystal set and boy operator um, playing the role of the 1869 novelty press and boy Ben Franklin. 
Um, the far-flung radio operators didn't need to imagine a realm called amateurdom. They had the, the one called the ether, um, though perhaps it was a little bit diffuse. Um, they didn't need to exchange um, correspondence through the mails because they were you know, communicating uh, over the air, though the eventual practice of exchanging QSL cards um, to, by mail to confirm radio contact uh, makes really interesting food for thought. Um, I should say that in less than a decade, amateur radio um, sort of exceeds amateur journalism by three orders of magnitude um, as wireless uh, uh, captured the public, uh, the public imagination. Um, meanwhile, the amateurs, writers, editors, printers, and publishers of amateurdom's long maturity, um, and today there's still a small group, group calling, the, calling themselves the fossils um, that work like uh, alumni. Um, they shared a, hi a history that tended to be chronicled year by year, elections, schisms, and intrigues, um, a fleeting golden age, studded with the names of predecessors and publications. Um, Harrison had approvingly noted uh, a shift from sensational to what he called pure literature during his brilliant if brief career. Um, the year 1886 brought turmoil surrounding a, a literary lyceum dead by 1888. Um, 1891 saw the, publish, uh, the publication of a 500-page retrospective literary anthology, or cyclopedia. Um, while Lovecraft eventually likened amateurdom to a university stripped of every artificiality and conventionality and thrown open to all without distinction. Its membership seeking mutually to draw their minds from the commonplace to the beautiful. Um, as now a putative revival of the uncommercial spirit, amateurdom had become an anti-modern gesture at authenticity. Uh, evolved against the slick magazines that heralded mass culture and evolved as well against the, we know, the kind of um, uptake of um, literary a critical authority um, by the academy so that literary critical authority stops being something that's um, constructed by commercial editors and publications, right, and moves into um, uh, uh, the academic sphere um, so that Lovecraft and his compatriots, I think, effectively soldiered on as, as junior elementary esthetes. Um, exerting their own um, uh, individual discernment toward a common cause, um, and while literature is no longer regularly the, the purview um, uh, of amateurs. Um, so my answer, I guess, would be no, um, that amateurs of one era are not the amateurs of another, even when a continuous tradition can be traced um, uh, among them. Uh, Lovecraft was no Thomas Harrison in more ways than one. Um, what changed and continues to change across time is not the DIY ethos or even what the amateur happens to do, but really the way that doing and its doability um, are situated within the broader cultural economy and the lives that cultural economy helps to shape. Um, Self-publishing is situated according in part to ongoing constructions of class, race, gender, and stage of life, that much is clear, as well as um, uh, ongoing articulations of domesticity, the disciplines, vocations, and professions. Um, we know too, as I've only been hinting, that amateur doings and doability would come to be situated in relation to both the structure and the content of mass culture. Um, and here, it's helpful for me to remember that Richard Oman starts the clock on mass culture with those slick commercial magazines of the mid-1890s. Um, of course, it, uh, it's the model of commercial broadcasting, radio again, um, developed in the late 1920s and 30s that would become the kind of um, uh, epitome of mass culture for its later and most influential critics. Um, but actually, mass culture is less to the point I want to make here um, than managerial culture. The so-called managerial revolution of the late 19th century produced the modern corporation and with it the modern office, replete with genres and new tools for communication, new bureaucratic imperatives, new labor cohorts and configurations. Um, the printer's monopoly um, on the look of printedness knocked a little bit askew um, with amateur printing, collapsed with the proliferation of typewriters, and an ensuing century of innovation directed at reproducing typescripts without setting type. Um, so mimeograph, um, hectograph, we call it ditto uh, eventually in this country, um, photo offset, and eventually Xerox, um, uh, then leading on to the different technology of desktop publishing. Um, journalism, um, like English professordom, had become a profession, but I think these changes in, in, are, are much more sort of salient um, uh, uh, and, and, and widespread, obviously. 
Um, the number of workers who went to work, sat reading and writing kind of the instruments of corporate speech, bills, memos, reports, the rest. Of course, it's going to take a lot more than generalizations like these um, to explain the specific forms that amateur publishing has taken in the extended era of managerial capital, and I know I'm going to run out of time. Um, I could probably use Lovecraft right, to connect amateurdom to fandom, right? and then I could use um, the commercial publisher Hugo Gernsback right, to connect radio, radio to fandom too, and get to but I'm just going to jump to fandom. I want to say a couple quick words about fandom, um, and then I'll, I'll work my way um, towards some general thoughts about DIY publishing and try to get to at least to this question of what is a zine. Uh, and that pressing question of, are you going to talk about zines? <laughs> um, so um, to what extent, uh, to the extent there was one, um, the Thomas Harrison of fanzine fandom was named Sam Moskowitz, a prolific chronicler and devoted collector who became a fan at the age of 14 and then stuck around for life, even working for a short time for one of the Gernsback uh, magazines. He published a multi-part history of fanzine fandom, um, The Immortal Storm, which is 250 pages. It's only about the 1930s. Um, but Moskowitz wanted more. Um, he wanted a continuation that would be appropriately um, uh, bibliographical, uh, so about the fanzines, um, and detailed. Um, so all I'm going to do is try and read, um, uh, read The Immortal Storm with a couple of fanzine uh, publications from the mid-1950s, when Immortal Storm was kind of collected into a typescript volume um, and reproduced um, to give you a, a kind of snapshot uh, of the fanzine fandom. Um, by uh, 1953, um, and this is sort of a census of titles, if you like, um, fanzine fandom uh, was roughly, uh, say, 9% printed, 17% ditto, 60% mimeograph, and then 14% either other technologies um, or just not known to the um, people who were uh, indexing forms. Um, in general, and this is just a, a very crass uh, generalization, printing came first, um, small fanzines, maybe six by nine inches, um, then the day of the hectograph, right, dittos, which grew them into eight and a half by 11 in purple, right, but reduced an edition size to about 50 or 60. Um, and then finally, uh, the mimeograph became a kind of dominant um, technology across several decades, at least into the 1960s um, uh, of the uh, fanzines. Um, as late as 1986, one astute fan noted, um, Riley, um, that mimeography recapitu recapitulates hagiography. Um, again, it's an incredibly self-referential -ref project. Um, earlier fans wrote not of hagiography, but of ego boo, short for ego boosting. Um, like amateurdom before it, fanzine fandom was in, 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 forever consolidating itself as itself um, by dint of chronicles, conventions, published comments, correspondence, and collecting, as well as reviews, digests, indices, insider jokes, and jargon. Like amateurdom, fandom was uh, put a premium on originality and authenticity, um, yet I think it also uh, largely escaped any anti-modern tinge um, by focusing on what, a, uh, what one fan called the literature of tomorrow, um, so science fiction. Um, I think I could safely generalize that fandom to this point remained more engaged than amateurdom had uh, with uh, the for-profit sphere from which it also distinguished itself. Um, and, and this is in part um, due to crossover by figures like Lovecraft and uh, Moskowitz, um, uh, as well as a certain amount of shoulder rubbing at these uh, conventions and for the purposes of collecting. Um, one might speculate that fandom differed in this respect partly because science fiction, the catalyzing object of fandom's self-imagination, um, evolved and persisted as a lowbrow form, um, so that literary critical authority over it was never relegated to the academy, but remained to be ne ne negotiated um, across commercial publications uh, and, of course, eventually uh, spheres like Hollywood. Um, the late 19th century evolution of the literary as an object of academic inquiry made no difference to fandom, um, though the evolution of psychology as an object of inquiry likely did. Um, so the, the amateurs of amateurdom had been all about character, um, but the fans of fandom were really about, they had personalities, uh, if you like. The denizens of fanzine fandom, almost universally white and male into the 1960s, um, saw themselves as selves, um, and selves of a special sort. It wasn't membership that made them unique. It was rather a kind of prior uniqueness that made them sensible as members. This is a point that's sort of hotly debated in a lot of different ways in fanzine fandom. 
Um, now, fandom persists, of course, um, radically diversified, expanded online. Um, now we have scholarly fan studies, um, too, a dumb of sorts, if there ever was one, um, relying not on amateur self-publishing, but on the not exactly profit-driven driven publishing of the Contemporary Academy. Um, but I'm going to have to break off my story of dumbs, um, amateurdom and fandom here, um, before the language of underground or subculture versus mainstream takes hold, um, in order to reflect, reflect briefly, um, if speculatively, on um, the history of amateurs, DIY, and, and by ex extension, um, the character of zines. Um, you've seen that rather than taking the kind of self-chronicling of these groups entirely at face value, I've tried instead to gesture more broadly toward the scriptural economy, um, its trajectory of engagement with consumer culture in particular, uh, and its late 19th century expansion in the service of managerial capital. Um, that framing, I hope, helps to reveal some of the shortcomings of any dichotomy um, between uh, mainstream and subculture, or maybe better put, between public and counterpublic. Um, in one sense, amateurdom and fandom are classic counterpublics in Michael Warner's terms. Um, their self-imagined realms of belonging evolved both by and for communication and in opposition um, to the larger reigning public sphere. Um, yet it would be well to remember um, that the Habermasian public sphere with its sharp line between public and private, um, between the home and the coffee house, the manuscript letter and the printed news sheet, um, depends upon a very simple, very idealized notion of print publication, um, the event of issuing into public, um, that I think really, you know, if it pertains at all, uh, pertains in, in really kind of selective contexts of the, maybe the 17th and 18th centuries, um, and not for later uh, periods or broad contexts. Um, certainly today, the eventfulness of publication is complicated by the scale and temporalities of the internet, um, the entanglement of publication with search, for instance, um, the prevalence of dead links and dynamic content, the uneven and obscure timetables of, of update and subscription. Um, but even before the internet, in this extended period of um, uh, the extended era of amateurdom and of um, uh, fanzine fandom, the pressures of social differentiation and the growth of institutions, um, of which the modern corporation only looms the largest, um, worked increasingly to complicate the eventfulness of publication. Um, in short, uh, amateur newspapers, fanzines, and their successors have always been imagined in contrast to commercially published periodicals. Um, but that imagination itself has become increasingly incumbent upon other unacknowledged contrasts between the zine and the less published or the semi-published forms that issue forth amid our increasingly institu institutionalized existence. Um, and here I'm thinking of the reports and pro proposals of the corporate workplace, um, the newsletters uh, of the voluntary association and congregation, um, the pamphlets of the public health agency, the course packs once ubiquitous on college campuses, even that much maligned annual Christmas letter uh, proper to the most important institution of control, uh, the middle class nuclear family. Um, amateurdom and fandom by these lights are less counter-publics than they are counter-institutions, self-organizing assemblages of members, male, media, genres, and lore um, that defy institutionalization um, partly by reproducing it cacophonously in an adolescent key. Um, now, later zines and alt arenas um, differ from the dumbs of amateurdom and fandom, no doubt. Um, yet they too might be considered not just for how they stand in contrast to commercial publication, but also for the ways in which that contrast helps to obscure other things, including the forever expanding and baroquely structured um, dominion of the document, the genre of the document. Um, so uh, let me just end with a kind of appeal and an anecdote, if you like. If we've gotten particularly good at noticing the ways that amateur cultural production has emerged and thrived online, um, I think we could get better um, at seeing all the angles um, from which DIY might be perceived um, uh, and, and understood, all these sort of relevant contrasts. Um, uh, that pressing question of zines, are you going to talk about zines, right, I, I think is in some sense a nostalgic um, uh, move, um, but there's a lot more to it too. So I just really want to try and uh, embed all this in a, in a, in a large, this, the question, if you like, in something of a larger um, window of questions. Um, and to that end, I'll just uh, sort of cut off with an anecdote. Um, this is from Alvin Toffler, the futurologist's 
um, uh, who as early as 1980 um, was using the term prosumer. Um, alas, not prosumerdom, uh, I checked. Um, uh, but um, I think you'll be surprised that in, the, in his um, sort of prediction, which comes pretty close to today's independent video, home offices, distributed computing, um, his prediction for the future, um, he appeals to uh, 1980s era DIY. Um, and what I find surprising is just the broad ambit here. So if you like, these are his, his examples. Um, uh, uh, home pregnancy test kits, right? Um, direct long distance telephone dialing, um, self-service gasoline pumps, um, and ATM machines, all brand new and really shocking um, in 1980, uh, for those of you who can teleport yourselves back as I can. And I think if you add mixtapes, copy shop, and film processing kiosks, you get a really nice set of context to start thinking about um, uh, desktop publishing, say, um, which would arrive a few le years later, courtesy of Aldous and Apple, um, to the embrace of amateurs and others. Thank you very much. Thank you.